Hi, I'm Ben Richardson, and you're listening to the Karate Podcast, where we talk about karate, the competitive sport of Kumite, and the warrior's journey. Brought to you in association with Kumite Coach, the world's first progressive online high-definition coaching platform, created by coaches and fighters for coaches, fighters, and students of karate. Join KumiteCoach.com today and take your karate to the next level. Okay, guys, welcome to another episode of the Karate Podcast. I am probably the most excited I've ever been right now uh, to have on the show with us, Junior Lefebvre. Uh, I'm sure you all know who Junior is and uh, what an accomplished competitor he is as well as a coach. Just to highlight some of his achievements, he is a two-time WKF World Kumite Champion. Uh, he held uh, a silver medal at the World Kumite Championships also. Three times bronze medalist in Kumite at uh, WKF World Championships. He is an EKF European Kumite Champion at open weight and four times EKF European Kumite Champion at minus 70 kilos, as well as being a two times EKF European Kata champion, which is hugely unique in the world of karate. Um, Junior is also a highly sought after coach around the world on the seminar circuit and heads the famous champions dojo in Belgium. And he is currently the head of uh, Kumite as the national coach for the English Karate Federation. So uh, Junior Sensei, absolute Pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Thanks so much for agreeing to be on the show today. Thank you to invite me and it's a pleasure to be present with you guys and to share a bit uh, yeah. of my knowledge here. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Junior, could we just start by discussing what events or circumstances led you to find martial arts? <clears throat> All right. So, um, I'm born in Belgium, in the city of uh, Brussels, and um, I used to live in a very um, tough neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, that we call Eterbeek, uh, very multicultural. And the problem was that I, I was bullied at school. Um, I was too gentle because my inside of me, I'm a very gentle person. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the teacher at school told my, told my father that I had, I had to defend myself. So uh, the first thing did what, what did my father was to, uh, to look for a martial art club. So um, my father is someone very um, strange in a certain way, but um, so what he did was he made me try a lot of, uh, lot of different martial arts, uh, kendo, judo, uh, karate, uh, uh, taekwondo, and so on. And after, let's say, Aikido, and after two months, he told me, okay, now you need to choose. You choose one, one of them. Yeah. And I choose karate. And what was it about uh, karate, do you remember, that, that stood out for you or drew you toward it as opposed to maybe one of the grappling arts like judo? Um... Actually, I one I, I did like uh, I did like kendo and karate, so I was of course more to uh, Japanese martial arts, where you had a lot of respects uh, with your opponent, uh, and um, I did like the, the 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 kicking kicking and punching part as yeah. well as the the technical part that you have to be very precise. In the technical part, yes. Um, I did like also a lot kendo, uh, and I did both at the same time for quite a, a longer time. I think two years, but I've stopped kendo because um, it didn't match with karate. Why? Because with, with kendo, your back heel has to be up all the time for the mobility of your deplacement, a bit, a bit like in, in sport kumite. But as I was more uh, a, a kata practitioner where a shoulder can, in shoulder can your heels need to be on the floor all the time, it was affect, affecting my practice. Uh, so I had to make a choice on the same time and I've choose karate. Interesting. And um, so you mentioned there that you, you know, you were focused on your kata practice initially. Um, yeah, yeah. So at what point did you start to 
um, A, move into Kumite, and <clears throat> B, uh, when did competition come into your life in terms of your karate? So my, my, my first, uh, let I would say my first real sensei, uh, his name is Dirk Hene, what is, um, he was the chief instructor for the Kaseha in Belgium. Yes. And actually on, the, on every training, it, he was more traditional karateka, of course. So we had a lot of kians, a lot, uh, lot, lot of kana, a lot of bunkais, um, a bit less of sport quality parts. But he was always doing a bit of, a bit of everything. Um, so I did prefer when I was a kid the kata part because I was better in the kata part than the kumite part. But my father, as very strange dad, obliged me all the time to do both. Yeah. Actually, I went to a championship, um, example, my first championship, got beaten in Kumite, they, they just beat me off. And so I didn't want to do it again, like all the other kids. When you lose, you don't, you, you don't like it anymore. And so I say to my dad, oh, dad, next championship, I'm only doing kara. And he say, no. He say, you want to do kara, you do kumite. If you don't do kara, I don't allow you to do, uh, I, I will not, you don't do kumite, I will not allow you to do kara. Wow. And so I did some championships first, both, but um, he saw that <clears throat> I needed more practice in, in, in the kumite part when I was about 12, 13. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, the fact that I was in a traditional club, um, I was competing with everyone that was okay till I was 12, 13. But one, once I, uh, I get a certain level, people were, were better than me uh, at 12, 13. So he saw that I need something. So I went to, um, to a club in Brussels mm -hmm. uh, where they only do fighting. Right. Um, and I remember till it was yesterday, the first day I went to the club. A little, I was about, yeah, 13, another kid, green belt, I was about one belt, and the green belt came to me and said, oh, you want to spar with me before the training? Okay, my father said, go, oh, go, have fun. He beat the shit out of me. <laughs> my nose was bleeding got a blue eye and stuff. And my father said nothing. You know, I was crying to my father. My father said, go back. And, and I would, you know, for, for England, it, it seems a bit strange, but someone, example, came to me to, um, like a medic to see. And my father said to the guy, hey, what, do, what are you doing? Why do you touch my son? Yeah, but your son is bleeding. No, no, it's not, it's just his nose. <laughs> so I, I, I I got that, no worries. You know, back in the time, it was more tougher, you know, yeah. more tough. Yeah. So I, I went to my father and say, why are you so, so hard with me? And he said to me, you want to be a champion, it will not come with kettles. It's only only way that, that you will, you will uh, learn is through the hard way. Wow. And he said, do that and you will see the difference. And it's true that every every single day I went, that kid, that kid was coming to me and say, "Oh, can we spar?" And he beat me every time, till my level went up, and I was beating the kid. And when I did beat the kid, the kid didn't want to spar with me anymore. Mm. And so I, I felt, oh, I take, I, I progress, I'm better now. And thanks to that. I think that was a big step for me mentally that every time I got some issues, uh, uh, something bad, I don't stop. I try to, to continue and to, uh, to pass over because mentally, I think I need, I need to go farther than this step. Yeah. And a few, and few times in my quality career, it helped me a lot. Yeah, I can imagine it. And I'm sure it helps in uh, your business life as well, having that mentality. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. You know, um, I think what, what, what kids do not understand now is that 
life is not easy when you know you, and you have to be tough like 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 in, in fighting you have to be tough sometimes today you got money tomorrow you don't but sure. if you don't, but if you don't stand up and put put your hands in the mud to work again it will not appear like this yeah so sure. you have to 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 come back and work and few times it it, it, it was like that for me yeah absolutely that's a great insight um in terms of that that training were you still training in the traditional club as as well in conjunction with this and if yeah not, yeah yeah so um i i i did follow sensei dirk um yeah, yeah but, uh, till i was 18 uh on the traditional side after um i went to um to patrick suar from paris Mm -hmm. That was at the start one of a uh, train of Michael Milan. Yeah. And I went there once a week, but that was more for the kata part. And uh, I continue on the other side, uh, my, my sport comedy part. Fantastic. Uh, what, what I did, what my father did with me in a certain way was to join a KUGB club first. Because in, in Belgium, it's not like in England where, we are, where you, you guys are all separated by, by associations. Here, the KUGB is part of the National Federation. Right. So you can be a member of KUGB, do the European KUGB or you know, uh, uh, European Shotokan and be part of WKF. Right. So, so that's not a problem. Uh, but the traditional part, the rules is that when you're 16, you're a senior. Yeah. And my father knew that. so. When I was quite tall when I was an uh, adolescent, 15. I was a, a meter 80 already. I was built like now. And so he put me in a KUGB club so I could fight with the seniors. Right. So I was fighting seniors without gloves, you know, the traditional karate Ippon Shobu. Yes. When I was 15, 16, and did European and World KUGB championships. Wow. Kata and Kumite and team and this and that. Mm. So it was like a, like a marathon for me. But again, if it, it did teach me to adapt myself to the, on, on, the, on the different situations. Yeah. You know, the fact that you have to, when you are 67 kilograms and you have to spar with someone that is 80, 84, 85, you need to adapt yourself, certainly with bare, without glove, bare, 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 bare hands. Mm, yeah and do you feel that those experiences i'm just jumping here um have influenced your your coaching style and the way you're quite dynamic with athletes and the level mm. of different types of movement and conditioning that you implement uh yes uh it it it, it do because i know how far a body can go you know that that's that's a big part yeah. Um, I know I was physically very strong. I know that that you know, my, that I was very strong physically, but I can I know also that the the human machine can go really really far if you if your machine is is well. Yes. Um, so I know how far I can push athletes. I know I will not break them, and so when I see someone with potential. I know how far I can go with it. Yeah, and do you agree that I heard a saying that um, the body can can achieve forty percent more than the mind believes it can? Do you believe in that that sort of scenario where the mind oh. can hold the body back? Of course, no. Everything is about your mind. Yeah. For me, oh, the karate teach me this. Everything is about your mindset. Um, you can be so powerful when your mind. Free yourself. Yes. I, I have an anecdote like this. Um, Japan, I think, yeah, Japan, a, a traditional world, world Shotokan karate, bare hands. And we had to, Belgium was in, in semi final against Germany. You know, Germans are really well known to have big people. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was fighting with that guy. And the first movement he does was a, a, a mawashigiri. So I, I, I duck a bit and I, I could feel his shin 
and the, the, the food passing my head. And I, and I really thought, he wants to kill me. If this, if this touched me, I'm not there anymore. Yeah. So bit by, because I was afraid, not afraid, but bit by fear and the adrenaline, I've punched the guy so hard that everything explodes. And because my, I was so prepared to punch him uh, that I've punched so hard. And after I said, damn, I didn't thought I was so strong. Yeah. I knew I was strong, but not like this. And yeah, when you have certain situation where sometimes you're afraid and you feel that you are in danger, you can be very strong. Yeah. And so the adrenaline makes that you can be really, really strong. And situations like that can be also the opposite. A champion can be pushed down by the pressure or yeah. he can be pushed up by the pressure. Yeah. Everything is about how is his mindset on that moment. Yeah. And as, as a coach, um, you're obviously dealing with multiple uh, levels of athlete as well as different personalities. Um, mm. Does that aspect of um, psychology come into your coaching very often with your teams and competitors? Yes. Yes. Um, so you have different type of people, of course. And um, everything is about the perception of the athlete on the information you are giving. Yes. So some people, example, they like when you are tactile on them, you touch them, you clap, you clap on their shoulders, you clap on their back, you clap on their legs. Some people do not. Some people like when you shout hard. Some people just want some inform some very short informations. Mm. Some people want you to shout nonstop. So you need to know how what prefer your the athletes. Yes. So yes. You, you need to know a bit the athlete to see how he reacts on the information you are giving to him. And then yeah, then go with him. What what was the best? And that's sometimes, that's why sometimes. Uh, even with athletes that are part of my team, some of them, I prefer not to coach them. Not that I think I'm not capable to coach them, but maybe I'm not the perfect person to coach them. Yeah. Uh, technically, yes, but on the spot, on there, sometimes you know, I'm very, I, I shout a lot and, and sometimes they need more, more quiet person than me. Yeah. And that's why then I say, okay, can you please go with that person and, and do like this, 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 and this? Yeah, mm. that's great. That's great to have that insight and understanding to connect with the athletes. Yeah. Um, so just going back a little bit, uh, Junior, what point was it that you realized or decided you were going to fully commit yourself to uh, karate as a way of life and career? Okay, so... Um... On, on the, you know, in, in Belgium, in my period, we didn't have any, any help. I mean, uh, now, uh, when you are a very high sport level athlete, like a few of my karatekas are, they have um, facilities at school and even universities. They can split the year in two and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have that in that time. So uh, you, could, you could follow everything or you didn't do it. So again, I have a father that, that is a bit strange, but um, I had a very good chat with him and I want, I want to be an accountant. So I did my studies to be an accountant. Right. And it's my father that at the first year of my first year of uni told me, Junior, don't do it, do karate. A father telling you, t telling a son to mm. go to the sport instead of or, or, of doing the, the you know the base business, and I say that why I say okay. I, I have to be frank with you. It's now when you are young that you will see if you are capable on sport point of view, not in ten years. Yeah. But your studies, you can still do it next year or the year after. If, if, if quality is not for you because you are not good enough, but you, you can still go back to, to uni and do yourself. 
and I will back you that time. But we cannot do otherwise. The time, time pass and you cannot recover it. Yeah. I mean, on sport point of view, two years is a lot. If you miss two years, you will need one more year for training and maybe it's too late. Yeah. So he was right. In a, on everything he said, he was right. He didn't say that I didn't have to go to work to gain money or whatever parallelly, but he said, your study and, 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 and study like 10 hours a day, you, you can't afford it if you want to be a world champion. Mm. He knew that. He said, you need, you need to commit yourself to what you want to do later. And he said, there are two, two stuff. Or you are one of the best. And you will be able to live from karate. Or you are not, go study. You see, half and half is not possible. Yeah. And he was right. So now... Um, I have no problem. I mean, living from, from what I like. Uh, I do seminars everywhere. I have my own club. Uh, but the fact that I was uh, nearly on the counter made that I could manage my, my money properly. And, uh, and that's, that's also good. So all the, everything was good for me. Yeah. It's amazing that your, uh, your dad had that level of... Um... I guess insight into what he believed you know you could succeed at and and you know helped you uh, go in that direction it's, it's usually mm, the opposite yeah. way around <laughs> yeah yeah but for 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 those kind of stuff my father was really good and strange yeah uh you know um example when you are when you're a young athlete when you are young you don't know the value of money you don't know who your your father pays you private classes. You don't know how much you need to work to get that, I don't know, 100 pounds for the private classes. Yeah. How, how, how is, what's the worth of 100 pounds? So my, my father for that was really good. When I was 18, he gave me, that's about, about 50,000. Let's say about 50,000 pounds. Yeah. He said, that's for you. you 18. That's for you. Wow. I was like uh, crazy. So I bought a car. I did this. I did this. Oh, I had money. In less than a year, I went back to my father and said, oh, you got a bit of money because I need to buy this. And my father said, no, nope, I don't have it. He said, yeah, but dad, you told me you had a bit of money on the side. And he said, yeah, money on the side is for me. Yeah, but what will I do? And he tapped my shoulder and said, you will do what damn I did when I was your age. You go and work. <laughs> yeah, but I have quality. You you find a, a part-time job so that you can you can find what you want. You want new shoes? You do this. Quality, I pay for it. So he was, and I understood how much you had to work to, to get the 50,000 back. Yes. That's and nice. it was in nine months, I spent it. And I, it was not in nine months that I came, I came back with 50,000. I can tell you already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a tough life lesson right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. But he was good, really good with this. Yeah, amazing. Um, so in, in your karate career, did you have separate um, coaches when you got to that elite level for kata and for kumite? Or was there a lot of the training just off your own back? How did that pan out for you? Um, <clears throat> The good point of, of having a, a traditional sensei was that I was used to go to championship without coach. Right. So, you know, when, when people say, oh, I don't have a coach, it's a problem. No, you have to fight. It's not me. So, and I know how it is. My father was the only person that coached me. Uh, yes, I had a lot of good trainers, like... Um, you know, the, the, a step, what made that I've changed a lot in, in Kumite. Oh, okay. Let's say, first, I will tell you why I did choose only Kumite than Kata. Then I will, I will come back to the other part. Because I was really, really good in both. Um, um, on, sen on European champion Kata in, in the juniors, 
the European Champion Canada and Committee in the Juniors. But when I came a senior, um, I was about fourth or fifth in Canada and bronze in, in Kumite. Yeah. My goal was to reach a senior medal in both. Uh, and I did on like Open the Paris. I was bronze in, in Canada. Uh, but on the same year, Michael Milon injured his knee. Michael Milon was a world champion. Yeah. And I was on that time number four. And I thought, that's my year. I trained like crazy to make Tenerife. Uh, it was European Championship in the Tenerife. Michael Milon will not be there. I can get bronze and make a medal in it. And what happened was, I, I was still f number four because a second French guy, that was Pardro, from place number eight, went to place number three. And everyone was like complaining that was it was a bit political. Yeah. Uh, because it was with a point system, you know, and that really discussed me a bit. And I went to my father and said, oh, I think in Cara, I, can, I cannot do it because it's um, too much about referee appreciation and the referees are a bit pushed by the politics to get you know, to get to give the points on the on the right countries. Mm. When in Kumite, when you kick someone in the head, he can avoid you to get a point once, but not twice. Yeah. So I said to my dad, I will focus more on the Kumite part, and uh, I will continue cadre training, of course, uh, because I love the, the the technical part. But I will focus on the Kumite on the competition. So I went then with uh, his agreement. To, uh, to different courses to find a new sensei in Kumite that could help me. And um, I've met Jose Manuel Ejea Caceres, that was three-time world champion and everything. And he was just out of his competition career. Mm -hmm. And uh, he accepted to uh, ac accept me in his club. Um, again, beat me, beat me from top to toe. <laughs> uh, because he wanted to see what I was worth. Yeah, I remember his word as, you are not the only one that asked me to train him and uh, I don't have the space. And it's true, his local was really small. You know, in the mm. center of Madrid, space is really expensive. So yeah. he could not accept a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, my temperament made that I, I, I was biting, biting all the time and I, I give the best I could. And at the end, he accepted me like his little brother. So I was training once a week, uh, one week a month, every month in Madrid. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, and he made the Kumite person I am today. That's amazing. And it's um, not about, uh, you know, the, I think the, the fact that he made me, he made me understand uh, how good are my good points and how bad are my bad points. And the fact that I had to adapt myself on my opponent. Yes. And you could see that I, I did change my fighting style after uh, after the one year I was working with him. Mm. My, my, my mobility did improve a lot. Uh, the, the feeling I had in the fight was improving. And uh, yeah, it was good. Brilliant. That's awesome. Um, I read that um, you never trained karate to, you know, to do the sport um, as such, but you felt that being involved in competitive sport helped you evolve as a karateka. Um, mm. Could you just uh, share with us your views on the benefit of being involved yeah. in karate? So, <clears throat> um, a lot of people are, are doing are doing karate because they want to, you know, they they want to compete. And as soon as they stop competing, they, they are gone. Yeah. They don't, they can, they cannot catch anymore any base to, to stay in karate. For me, it, it, it was completely different. Basically, I love karate for the sweat and the pain I have at training sessions. So that's, that's my, my joy is to have pain when I'm, I am on the tatami. Yeah. But I know that I have 
to test myself and the test was the competition. But um, back in the time, I was much more dangerous in a training session than in a competition. Right. Because my idea, um, and that's because, again, because of my father, that, that teach me that there is only one way, the hard way and stuff like that. It became really something inside of me. So the, the only goal I had on the moment was to be world champion. And I knew being world champion means beat everyone. So training or not training, I was beating everyone. But the, the fact on the competition, a referee stop in the training, no one stopped me be, to beat you. Yeah. So people, people had to stop sometimes and go out of the training because of me. But I was like that. So for me, that's the part I've liked. I, I always loved was to, to feel that I was the best on the mat. Yeah. On traditional karate and sport karate. For me, there is absolutely no difference. Mm. And with the, um, with the growth of uh, karate on the world stage that's so recently been in the Olympics. Um, obviously, as the WKF has developed, um, you know, it's, it's uh, practiced all around the world on, and it's uh, being streamed live. Do you feel that the progression of this karate is, is pushing students to choose, you know, to specialize in kumite or specialize in kata? Or do you think there's still space for the trad traditionalists to do well at that level? Um, I think you can to do like I did before is nearly impossible anymore. Right. So to to have uh, there are, there are still I know there there is a, a Japanese girl that did uh, a medal in both, um, but to do it now in the senior level I think is nearly impossible um, because of the really high level of all the little countries also as well. So yes. the, the basic quality level uh, went higher. The, um, the commitment you need to make the, all the different uh, Serie A's, K1 and everything, I think physically it's asking you maybe more than, than how it was before. Uh, before, you had only the European and the World Championship as really major competition. Then, of course, you had Open Paris, Open Italia, but short, short traveling, short time. So yeah. I could go to the Open de Paris the day I fight and I come back the day after. Now you need to stay there for a week. You need, oh, it's, it's asking you a lot of time, a lot of money. Mm. Uh, do I see Quarry going to the Olympic like a good way? Um, as an English national kumite coach, I have to say yes, but, but as a traditional kwanika, I will tell you no. Right. I think inside of me, one part of me say that we are selling our soul mm. to the Olympic and that we are losing what is kwari at the start. And kwari for me is, is something uh, a, a mindset that you want to you want to kill the other one yeah. yeah when you're on the mat it's like it's like a japanese samurai you are there there are opponents you put them down you come back it's finished and now the lucky i think wkf saw that we were going to a wrong direction of the uh, warnings too much warnings and they are coming back to a bit harder type of quarry. Lucky for us, because on a certain moment, for me, quarry was not quarry anymore. Yeah. And now we are coming back to a harder, harder quarry. You see that uh, uh, in 2023, the, um, we allowed more, more contacts for the, for the U21, the juniors and the cadets. So yeah. that's already a good step, I think. Yeah. Now putting putting uh, electronic and everything is that a good step? I don't know. We will see in the future. Uh, I think we need we need a year time to see if it is good or not. Sure, sure. Um, 
Okay. Um, could you share with us, um, looking back over your career as a competitor, your favorite memory of competing and what you're most proud of? Um, I got a lot of good memories, but um, it's maybe funny because you are, uh, I speak with uh, an English person, but I will say that beating Wayne Otto the first time was something very, I was really proud of the first time because it was one of my idols yeah. uh, on, 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 on that part. Uh, so I've met, I've met, of course, Wayne a few times, but the first, the first time I was quite young, I think I was 19. And as a 19 young boy, being one of the best champion in the karate circuit was of course something I was really, really proud of. Yeah, I bet. Um, otherwise, of course, my success as a world champion. And I think, when you see the, the 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 world championship I did in Munich, it was quite exemplar because you you can see on the second round I was losing, and then I came back, I, I, I came back at the last moment. Uh, I did a very good semi final against Belassen from France. Yeah. Uh, so the the whole tournament was good, but I think the whole year that I did there was good, mm. and the the joy I had of course was like an explosion of joy, but it's more about the hard work I did the whole year, the whole year to achieve that. Mm. Because I remember that year, I went to every single tournament I could. Saturday a championship, Sunday another one. Uh, I, sometimes Saturday I was uh, in Croatia, Sunday I was in Italy, then I drive back, went to England. All the championships you could even imagine, I did win it that year. Wow. So for me, if I would have lost Munich 2000, I think I would have stopped my karate sport career. Yeah, because of the level of commitment you put in that year. Yeah. And can I just ask you, going back to uh, Wayne Otto, because often when you haven't, you know, someone you look up to in a sport or someone you might idolize, you, you could get starstruck facing someone like that so how did you deal with that match and frame it in a way that you could produce your best karate i was always fighting really well under pressure that's that's the point that i told you you know pressure can push people down and that was one of my problem before i've met jose manuel Herrera. right but is when you know yourself 100% and you know what you can, what are your good points and bad points and what you can achieve, you have no limits anymore. And the fact that you combine that with a strong mind that I had, it's a good combination. So I had the, the body I trust 100% and the mind, and in my mind, I was there, I don't care, it's way not to, I want to kill him. But really, I was there excited. I wanted to fight him. I wanted to fight him to beat him. Yeah. It was not, oh, I will do the best I can. No, I was on the mat. I was saying, I don't care. He's world champion. I'm better. And I knew that, that I was better than him. Yeah. So putting, putting yourself in a, such a mindset, push your body. And, and stimulate stimulate your, your skills. And when you see the fight, you see that I, you know, both athletes are really good, but one had better reaction than the other one, he wins. Sure. And um, at what point in your career did you start to, to coach? And more so, at what point um, did, did like all these elite level competitors start coming to, to your dojo? So, um, when I did achieve my goal in uh, Munich, um, I knew already that I, I wanted to uh, open a club and uh, live from karate by instructing, by, by doing seminars and instructing people. I was doing that already a little bit. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, and I could live from Kuali because on that time Croatia did give me um, like like some some kind of salary uh, to uh, to train uh, some of the national team members and to compete for them. Yeah. But I knew I had to to start building something my own, and that was the a counter part of me that, that told me that. So um, I started teaching a lot and I see that I got, because of my world title, I got a lot of demand. I yeah. cannot train anymore like I wish. Uh, and I see that on a certain time, that balance of training to compete between giving classes start to break. So I'm, I'm doing the next world championship 2022 without training, without training for myself. I did train a lot of good athletes, but I was not training myself. Yeah. And just because of my experience and everything, uh, I, I succeed to a silver medal on that, on that championship. But you can see there, I don't have any joy or any sadness. So I'm not sad and I'm, I'm not happy. You understand that you are vice world champion and you are not happy. And when I went on the podium there, I I look, I look, my father say, Dad, we're gonna quit. Because I have no emotions anymore. And because I'm not doing championships because of the cha no, I'm not doing quality for the championships. I say I, I want to I want to enjoy the training uh, uh, again. Yeah. And so um, I've stopped in 2020, uh, 2003, um, yeah, 2003, because uh, Croatia wanted me to do the European Championship, so I did that and I, I've quit. But I love to train, and back in the time, I had the contact. Some 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 athletes from Australia came, you know, a lot of countries came to the dojo, and I was. I was still a good competitor, so I was beating them, bashing them, and you know, that was exciting. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the thing that I, I liked. And they invited me. They invited me in Australia to the national, national training sessions. So that was my first step as a trainer for a foreign country. So I went to Australia with the national team, and um, I see about 20, 30 people, seniors, juniors, U21s. They were lazy, they were not on time. Oh, it was completely not what I liked. <laughs> oh, uh, the, the training was at 10, and uh, because I was there on the Friday, I had to teach on the Saturday, yeah. And I could see at night people going from one room to the other one, enjoying having a drink. Oh, kid stuff, you know, young, young, young kids stuff i understand that but for me you can you can drink or, or party the whole night 10 o'clock is 10 o'clock when you have to train certainly when i teach yeah so i got a got a few kids too late and i say okay i'm the person that needs to teach you we are we are uh 15 minutes uh, too late 10 push up per minute 150 and i say all of us even me, and I make the 150 push-ups with them. And then I got a kid coming 30 minutes too late. And I say, kid, 300, otherwise you don't go in. And say, no, no, 300 push-ups now. And you look at me, I'm not doing that, the, the push-ups. So I grab the kid, I throw it on the floor, and I say, you are doing your damn push-ups. I got, a, I got a, a lawyer, a lawyer letter the same wow. day. So made a step back and, and I, 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 <laughs> I see uh, when, they give me the, when they give me the paper, just before the training, they give me the paper. I said, what the hell is this? And then the, one of the assistants told me, oh, that's Australia, mate. There are lawyers, this, that, that's why, you know, we cannot touch the kid, we cannot do this. And I look at the paper and say, I don't care, I'm Belgium. So I, I whip this and I say, guys, I got the solution. I'm not a coach anymore, I'm an athlete. <laughs> and I say, I ask everyone to spar me now. 
and I put referees and I spy everyone and I bashed everyone. All of them, senior, female, male, all of them. And that's how I got the contract of three years for Australia. Wow, it's a good story. Really nice. And that, that was my first step with the national team, actually. Uh, so I was like, um, not a national coach from Australia, but um, like a technical director a little bit. So they, they came to me. I went there, spent two months, uh, two months. I went to all the clubs in Australia and we did a great job. Then after three years with them, I, was, uh, I became coach of Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. um, that is a small country but got a um, lot of um, money for the athletes. So we succeed, I succeed with them to get some, some Europeans and world medals uh, with some of the athletes. But um, I've stopped with them because for me, the country was too restricted. I mean, the, the too few people. No, when you when you go to a European Championship and you go with three people, four people, I'm not used to that. You know, I, I want I want something to move. Yeah, I had more excitement with my own club that was bigger than the than the national team. So uh, even maybe I had I had to stay because the salary there was really really good, really well paid. But again somewhere because I'm well paid I stay somewhere because I'm excited yeah. so I do quality because I love it I don't do quality because I need something from from, from, from someone sure. so you will never get me in a seminar for money you will get me for a seminar because I like where I'm going and I, I, I like the project yeah. not for something else yeah fantastic yeah and then after after Luxembourg, I've uh, uh, I spent a few years only to um, to accept athletes from outside and to um, to train them and to make them at the best level. And, and that's where I had Rafael Agaev, uh, Tsanos, uh, some of the Moroccan athletes that are there. Um, yeah, that was um, another challenge for me. Yeah, I'm sure. It must be uh, must be great to work with that level of athlete. I, I assume that it's quite uh, a different yeah. um, flow of information between athlete and coach at that level. Yeah. And um, then I saw an advertise about England, England searching a, a national coach. And uh, it's true that on that time, England was really on the bottom because it was already a few years that England didn't, didn't produce any medals, uh, none with the uh, kids or with the seniors. You had, you had a, few, a few good athletes like uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Thomas, Natalie Williams, uh, Joe Kellaway, of course. And you had sometimes, sometimes a good result there and there, but that was not something regular, consistent. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's a new challenge, maybe to have, to, to make grow the level of England again, because, you know, uh, England is a, a, a very popular country for, for quarry, and that could be a good challenge for me. And that's why I accept it. Oh, fantastic. And how, how have you found working uh, within the EKF and um, how, and I guess changing the strategy for the athletes. For me, the you know, I think everyone is on the same line that everyone wants to uh, to make the best to achieve that we get results. The the problem I got is, of course, athletes do not have any fin financial help, but. I cannot blame EKF, you know. I had to learn and, I, and I, I've learned a lot of, lot of points. Associations are strong. Mm. Federation is not so strong. When you, when you have a license slip that is, how, many, how, how much is that, three pounds? 
I'm, I'm not sure what the actual value of the slip is. I know what RSA is. I think it's about, about three pounds. Mm. So you pay, you pay a federation three pounds to, to be a member of, a, of your national federation. You go to a Starbucks, you ask a, you ask a coffee, it's about the same. So yeah. what the hell do you want to do? Even you got 50,000 members that pays three pounds. It's not enough. You know, for, for a country like, like you guys, in Belgium, we pay 40, 40 euro mm. for a license. Yeah. So that's, that's about 35 pounds. Yes, the associations get back money, half here in, in Belgium, but the other half is for the federation. Yeah. So England is the cheapest country to practice quality on national level. That's amazing. I don't see even France. I think France is about 30 euro. Uh, Luxembourg is 40 euro. So what can you do? Yo, and it's normal then, then when, when the federation do not have a, a back, a big money back that they ask the athlete to pay themselves to represent the country. Yeah. For me, that was something very hard to accept. Yeah. You represent your own country and you have to pay. For me, that was unbelievable. Yeah, that does uh, sound ridiculous to me. But, uh, but now I do understand. But it seems like there's a, an easy solution then. We should just charge more for the license. Look. Yeah, but associations, I, I do not accept it. I think uh, if I do remember well, since it's a tender, uh, did propose that to uh, one of the AGM and uh, they asked him to shut up about this <laughs> because yeah they didn't want to charge more Sorry. maybe your know, the associations uh, gain money on the side but maybe they gain too no I don't want to be involved with, with intern intern politics and I don't want a head of association to send me a, an email about about that but I do think that a federation need to be independent. I mean, independent financially. You, for the moment, you don't have any support of, a, of an Olympic committee right now. I mean, from a government body. We don't have money from uh, English sport or UK sport. But even we don't have that, we should support of athlete financially at least a minimum. Yeah. And yes, EKF is trying to do the best uh, they can with what they have. Sure. If they don't have, they cannot support. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and everything is around that. You know, when you don't have a lot of money on the side, you can ask, you, can, you don't pay a secretary person full time. You can ask that person to work like a full time. Yeah. You, so it's it's normal that we look like amateurs when you when you are only people that help. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I've, I've talked to quite a lot of fighters over the last few seasons of the podcast, and um, the overwhelming challenge that they they cite is is a lack of funding, um, which yeah. would allow them to travel to multiple international events, which obviously gains them experience. Yeah, no, you know, the, 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 what, what I did this year, um, I, need to, I, I needed to oblige a bit more people to go overseas to, uh, to, uh, um, to confront themselves with, with another level. Mm -hmm. Because what I've said to, to the board and everyone agrees, do you think that right now, only by doing national events, do you think you can produce a champion can, that can be a world champion? No. no. Only by doing your national championship or your British championship, you cannot be sure that you will have a medal at the world's and Europeans. So you need, you need people that goes overseas. I don't say that they need to do all the championships, but they do, they do confront themselves with people that are on the European circuit all the time. Yeah, yeah. And once you have that, your 
national level will go up. I mean, the English level will go up. And once the English level will be good again, people from overseas will come to your championships. Sure. But for the moment, you don't see any stranger in your championships. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself why. There are two points. One, general level, too low. Yeah. Second, referee general level, too low. I don't say that you have only bad referees. I say that the general level is too low compared to the general level of Belgium, France, Germany. Yeah. Where they invest much more money on their referees and on the capacity of their referees. Mm. So once this will go up, yes, you will get people back. Okay. And we we did the, this year we did a very good year, and in 2022 where we had junior medals, world medals, and um, you can you can hear already the, the the people from other countries saying, oh, England England is on the on the white path. Yeah. So yeah. people now are looking maybe to come back to uh, to the to your championships. But what you need to do now is make that regional athletes and, and club athletes goes first a bit outside to the Belgium Open, to a, to a Netherlands uh, championship in France. Mm -hmm. You show them that you are really, really good. And when you come back, people will follow because they will say, oh, I want to beat him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great insight there, Junior. Thank you. Um, so just to wrap up, Junior, um, it's a new year. Um, what projects or, or new goals do you have for yourself uh, for 2023? Uh, that my, my goal, actually, the, the real goal I have is not for 2023, but 2024. So my goal on long term is that we got two medals at the World Championship Youth in Venice. Fantastic. So that's my goal. And, but I know that you know, athletes that are now will change division. So we need fresh blood. We need to continue the good work. And I know that the ones that are good now will continue to be good and they will become good seniors. So I hope in 2024 to maybe also have another medal on the senior level. Yeah. And I will see if my my hard work, the pay, and the, the program I did this year, asking people a bit more commitment to uh, those different championships uh, will pay. Uh, I'm pretty sure that about the selection now, everything, everyone agrees about the system I want to implant, that it's not anymore a, a fight-off system, but yeah. a point system. Sure. Uh, because for me, that was also something I was not agree with uh, that you ask a fight off to select yourself to a world championship. You know, uh, I know maybe for the English mentality, it, it, it was because uh, you, you've worked a long time like that. But for me, an athlete need to be selected looking to his performance, not on one day, but on more than one day. Yeah, yeah. You, you can have a good day, the day of the fights off. That's not why you should be selected. The best person should be selected, not the best person that day. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, Junior, um, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been a real privilege to talk to you and uh, thanks for your insight and honesty. Um, wish you every success for 2023 and the years to come. And I hope we get to chat again soon. And hope to see you on on the tatami, maybe you and us together. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers.